All right, guys, so we've chosen to sit down because we want to just meet everyone where you are, but now I realize we're a lot shorter we are in the than everyone, but that's part. okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very comfortable. Um, hi, guys, thank you so much for showing up tonight. I know it's real shitty outside, um, and it's so amazing that you guys took the time to come out and get together and get to know each other. You know, talking to so many people here already in the last 40 minutes. It's been like, hey, what's going on in Chicago with fashion? And what are people doing? And, you know, the connection and the community and all of that. And so I'm so excited to be here with you guys because it's wonderful to see community and connection and everyone talking about what the hell's happening in fashion these days, you know? And um, a little bit later on tonight after these guys give a lovely talk about all the things you need to know about production, I'll be talking a little bit about the state of the emerging fashion designer and really some of the things that you need to be knowing about how to get ahead and what's happening in the marketplace. There's been so much ambiguity and, oh my God, retail's going to shit, what's happening with all these stores closing. But I'll have some words on that and I think that'll be exciting. Um, for many of you guys who do not know who on earth I am, um, my name is Shama Maher and I run a company called Scaling Retail, which many of you guys may have seen that name on some of the invitations. Um, my company is based out of Los Angeles and New York City. It is both a consulting firm and an agency. So not only do we you know, become strong pain in the asses for a lot of our clients, making sure they think about things like sales, marketing, merchandising, gross margin planning, markdown planning, all those things that you're not thinking about when you're making stuff. Um, those are the things that we really focus on. So if you can make it, we can sell it. You know, on the agency side, we focus on branding, business development, marketing, sales, again, all the nitty gritty business side of things uh, from the fashion side, right? So the business side of fashion, that's us. We have an amazing team, we do all sorts of cool things. I'd be happy to talk to you guys more one-on-one. -on -one. But for now, I think that's all about me. Oh, one, more, one or two more things. Um, Ah, my fabulous fashion career. So I used to be a buyer at Barney's New York, which some of you guys might be trying to sell your stuff at. Um, I also used to run a division at Gucci. So I ran a $50 million business and turned it into $100 million in about two years. Um, it took a toll on my soul, so I'm no longer at Gucci, but um, I certainly made them a lot of money. So I, that's kind of what we're good at, right? How do you extract and make money and do something with these wonderful, brilliant ideas that you have. So thank you for coming today. It's gonna to be a pleasure to talk to you guys, hear more about your businesses, and I'll let you guys take it away. Perfect. Yeah. So I can't second what you said enough. Like When we have designers come together in a room and talk to each other, it's just like this amazing energy. And that doesn't happen that often with Jennifer and I meeting with clients one-on-one -on -one in our office, so we're all really excited that you're here. So, I'm excited for clients to meet each other. Yeah, yeah that's you. <laughs> <laughs> and we were so excited to partner with Shama for this event because her services and her business complements what we offer to our clients so well. So our clients, some are in this room, but are entrepreneurs. And they come to us with a product idea, and we do the product development side of things. So we're sourcing materials, we're prototyping, we are doing the factory management, making sure that things in production run smoothly because that's its own job in itself, production management. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we specialize in women's wear, children's wear, and athletic or active wear. So that's pretty much us in a nutshell. Um, anything to add? Well, I'm Jennifer. There you go. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Catherine, who's also part of the team. So we're, yeah, product development side and production side, and Shama's Shama service. Meet sales, marketing, yeah. merch. I mean, can Which you think of here. a better group? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer and I are going to talk for a few minutes um, about a topic that we were inspired by for this evening. So basically, it's going to be think before you produce. Mm -hmm. So this is really... Uh, what that means to us is like having a like a gut check system in place or something where you are as a designer as, a, as an entrepreneur you're often like in a solo bubble you may have a business partner it may just be you making decisions for your own brand so it's how do you think and make these decisions on styles or on products before you pull the trigger to produce so what we're calling it is our three-point checklist which I had to write down and say 20 times because I 
rearrange those words. Um, but the three point checklist to think about before you produce any new product. So whether this is your first season or whether this is your 15th season, anytime you're going to go into production, we're in a cash heavy industry. You're gonna be paying for materials, you're gonna be buying trims, you're gonna be paying for the cut and sell. So we just want you to take a step back and kind of mentally run through this three point checklist before you pull the trigger on production. Not to like interject on top of you, but no, go. I think designing <laughs> something we were watching the, the prototypes kind of come to life and go through A to Z. You can get so excited and caught up in the design of it and not really step back and think about like the business side of it or you know all the other important factors that kind of roll into that design decision. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So our three points that we're gonna revisit quickly are fit, function, and being on brand. So first in regards to fit, this is a huge one for our industry. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't sell. Like I know you have all gone into a dressing room at some point with some beautiful garments, put them on, the zipper doesn't go up quite right, something that is not looking right, and you don't buy it. It goes back on the return rack, right? So this is so big. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't sell. So we are essentially gonna walk you through the fit process. So if you were a client walking in our door, what does that fit process look like and what are the steps involved to really fine tune that fit and make sure it's just right before you produce? So first step is a fit model. So the fit model that you're using, you really want to be in your target market. So you want to be fitting your garments on your potential customer to make sure that they work. And what we mean by that is their age, their lifestyle, and their body shape. So age, that's an easy one. Lifestyle, are they working out all the time? Are they more of a couch potato? That's gonna be two different fits, right? Are they, what's the shape? plus size, petite, tall, is there a specific niche in the market that you're going after in terms of body shape? So you wanna make sure that you're always using that fit model as your base and your standard for your brand. Anything to add? You got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when we walk through the fitting process, if you are a client coming our door, the very first step that we do is a prototype fitting. So this is not cute. This is not going to be your production quality garment. This is not what you see in the store. This is a working garment and a working fitting where we are taking the time to really walk through every detail. Like the details that we walk through in fittings with our clients, some people are like, why? I never even thought I, I would care. have ever <laughs> been making a decision on an inch and a quarter versus an inch hem turn. <laughs> um, Wait, what is that? Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, got it. I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Um, so this is what that prototype fitting is to nitty gritty. It's like going through all of the details. And then we revise that pattern and we make a second set of samples to fit. And we do a second fitting. And in that second fitting, we're really fine tuning. So this is, you've already gone through these bigger decisions. We had a client just in our office yesterday and she had come to us with her beautiful sketches and they, all of her pants had a 29 inch inseam. So from you know the rise to the floor. And she's like, this is what I want. I want my 29 inch inseam. And we put them on her and they were all three inches short. <laughs> so with the shoes that she wanted to wear with her pants, they were all three inches short, so we had to revise that. So that was a big change that we caught in the first fitting. But second fitting, you're fine tuning. So you have your inseam, you all have all of the decisions made, and you're just making kind of some further design tweaks. And then we more often than not do a third fitting with our clients as well. And this is where we're really close to the perfect fit. So this is that check, right? Like, does it fit? And it's a process to get there, but it's so worth it. It doesn't fit, it doesn't sell. You have to have patience. Yes. <laughs> um, and then also, I mean, once it's fitted and you have this sample, what do you do? You've got to test the function. So not only does testing the fit take a long time, but it's important that you test the function of what the garment is for. So this covers a wide range of parts of your garment. So everyone has that one dress, you know, they can't put on or get into unless someone's there to help them get into it. So those are things you need to think of while you're designing the dress. But it's also, you know, what are you going to use the dress for? Is this going to be the best travel dress that doesn't wrinkle? If so, like, test it, you know, does it wrinkle? We had a client that uh, did a travel bag, and she came to us and she was so excited because she designed this, like, super creative way to open her bag. So she was really smart about it. She took the bag when the prototype was done. It was super cute. And she went on a, um, a cruise with it. She realized on her cruise that when she opened it the way that she wanted to open it, everything fell out. <laughs> so, I mean, she did a good job using it the rest of the time, um, what she could use it for, and she beat the crap out of it. 
And she came back and we were like, all right, you know, let's go back to the drawing board and figure out how to redesign this bag. And of course, you know, it lengthens, lengthens your timeline, but you rather figure that out now and then pivot and change your design and get it right instead of going to market when your customer is like, this doesn't work. Because then you may just get a bunch of returns. Exactly. Yeah. So it's super important. I mean, everything that you design has a purpose. If it's a ski jacket, go skiing. If it's a, an athletic line that's meant for yoga, you need to do yoga over and over and over again and wash it <laughs> over and over and over again. And it might get frustrating because you're like, I'm sick of this. But you have to do it. I would also add to that that you should recruit other yogis. Yes. <laughs> for part of your function and testing it because yes. you may get other insights and other ideas that you know, you're know you so in it as the entrepreneur and as the designer that it's sometimes helpful to get some other outside perspectives from your target market. Right, and also it is a bit of a juggling act. You know, if you test forever, you'll never launch. So you have to find the perfect timeline of like, I've now tested it enough time, I feel confident, it's time to do this. Or time to drop it. <laughs> yep. So, those are the first two. Then we need to make sure the last gut check really is about making sure that what you're designing is on brand. Yeah, and this one really is like the gut check, especially as an entrepreneur, as a designer starting out, like, and a lot of times you are your brand, you know? So you have to speak to the essence of you, like is this right or not? But really, like what does on brand or off brand mean? Uh, to us, we've kind of defined that as your brand should convey your vision and values loud and clear. So it's like everything you know that your consumers, that the media, that the general public sees and thinks about your brand communicates a clear message that's easy to understand. So I know that's a little bit abstract, but I think it's just so different for mm -hmm. every brand and every entrepreneur. So we have a little example. So we were thinking about athletic wear and talking about active wear um, earlier, and we were thinking about like the brand Fabletics, right? Mm -hmm. So they did a great job with, in my mind, this is like the fast fashion <laughs> active wear. Um, so they're doing new styles all the time, bold prints, they're making these like trendy active wear athleisure pieces, and it's at an inexpensive price point. I think you can get an outfit for $25 or something like that, like a full outfit, which I think is crazy. Um, That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and then compared to like Nike, who's tried and true, been in this industry for so long, and they're focused on the athlete, or even on the everyday athlete, right? And they are in it with the technology and their fabrication. So I think they invented dry fit, and now every other brand has some version of that dry fit textile. Um, and then they have a little higher price point to kind of compensate for, you know, what they do as a brand. So if you're thinking about launching an activewear line, like where do you fall within the spectrum? Of course there's so many others, but it's just determine kind of <laughs> your brand and where you fall in the existing marketplace. So you know, when it comes to Fabletics or Nike, every time they design something, they're probably doing a gut check, like does this fall within a brand? So for instance, if your athletic brand is about sustainability and you've been building all these garments based on, you know, 100% recycled polyester from bottles, but then you fall in, the new, fall in love with the new polyester fabric, not recycled from models. Do you go with that fabric? Is it on brand? Do you have to you know, let it go by the wayside? Or do you find another way to spin the sustainability? It's all about figuring out how that fits into your brand or dropping it. Yeah, and a lot of that has to do with trusting your gut and your instinct, especially starting out as an entrepreneur. And if anyone's interested after this, I can show you a mm -hmm. quick like yes or no question situation that we used to do. Ooh, what is it? <laughs> So essentially, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, you have to stand up and do this right. with me. Okay. So um, if you're not sure about something, have someone ask you a yes or no question, but not uh, about it, but you don't know what the question is. So you're going to ask me a yes or no question, and I'm going to put my arm out, and you're going to push on my arm when you uh, when I answer. Okay. So I mean anything random. Do you like pizza? That means yes. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I was wrong. That means no. So you feel a strong reaction to it. Like, ask Let's me, try it again. Yeah, ask me if I'm going to, like, pretend I'm developing an a athletic club. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. So not, I mean, <laughs> not pizza <enough>. works, too. Because <laughs> okay. um, we're using that as an example. Okay. And I'm going to be, I don't know, I have a legging and a top and a sports bra. Okay, cool. <laughs> Is this product good for Bikram yoga? That means, like, yes. Right? Like, I want to sell this to be from yoga yeah. clients. But it's, essentially, it's like, should I use this fabric? Should I use this blue fabric? If you go like this, that's your gut saying no. Mm. You really don't want to use that blue fabric. If you keep your arm up strong, then yeah, yeah keep that yeah. in your mind. And this is how um, 
Sorry, we sold $28 million in girls' dresses, like, annually wow. by doing this gun yeah. check. And it, I mean, it works. I mean, you can think it's like the little woo-woo or a little fluffy, but <laughs> So that's it. That's our, like, really kind of our three-point checklist before pulling the trigger on production. So we really want you to buy into inventory that works. So, yeah, I want yeah. you guys to also, you know. <laughs> that's a really important thing. All right, so I'll like take it away. It. So... Yeah. Do any of you guys subscribe to Women's Wear Daily? Oh, business of fashion. Does anyone read business of fashion? Anyone read the news in general? In general. Okay, so you would have been hearing things like retail is dead, right? It's like, I feel like every day it's like these stores are closing, right? And people are getting fired, they're getting laid off. It's like this real, everyone's in dire straits. And yet, right, yet, the state of the emerging fashion designer remains more optimistic now than ever. And so I'm gonna share with you a few reasons why and how you guys as fledgling brand owners can really start to take advantage of what's happening in today's climate, right? So yes, retail models are over, right? Existing retail models, the archaic retail models, the methods of the Sears, of the Macy's, these guys are over. Right? It's like no longer is it just enough to have your product in a brick and mortar store. You've actually got to be spending way more marketing dollars to be able to drive that consumer engagement and that emotional conversation. So these guys were talking earlier about, hey, you've got to have the right branding. Is the product in alignment with the right branding? The question to ask yourself is, is my branding in alignment with the customer that I want to be speaking to? Right? And how does all of that kind of come synergistically, 360 degrees, to give you the right product at the right time in front of the right customer? Right? Again, it's no longer about just selling your stuff at the trade shows. The markets have changed. Right? So how exactly have they changed? Well, brick and mortar retailers and pop-up shops somewhat like the space we're in tonight are really considered now to be media touch points. Right? So what do I mean by that? Well, a media touch point is in essence a place where a consumer can be engaging with the brand, engaging with the product, and it's really curated in more of an event-like atmosphere. Right? So it's no longer the product is just sitting there. Right? The question you have to ask yourself, and when I talk to retailers, I always ask them, what would you be selling if your product was free? Right? If all of a sudden the products you were selling had no real monetary value, what is the emotional value and communication and visual branding and feeling and excitement that you're really conveying to that customer? Now oftentimes when I meet with clients after they've spent so much time in product development, sometimes they're really exhausted, right? They don't really know what to do next because they're so focused on, I just got to sell it. Right? I've spent so much time in product development. Many of you guys will have or have already underestimated the amount of time it takes to really get the right fit, the right product for that right market. And by the time it comes to selling it, sometimes the feeling is that I gotta just sell it and get it off the shelves. But you don't really stop to question yourself and say, hey, is every single branded communication that I'm pushing out there, is every single marketing objective and initiative really coming back to say this 360 degree world, right? Am I really pulling in that customer into my specific lifestyle? So yes, fashion is not dying, but fashion is evolving, right? We are in a new level of selling, right? We are in a game of selling where lifestyle is really the key. A customer would prefer to buy their water bottle, bottle from that yoga company than they would to buy it from a water bottle company. And why is that? Because today's customer is really engaged with the emotional experience. They want transparency, right? They want to be able to feel like they know you, right? That they know the brand. And whether that's a manufactured version of you or the brand or an authentic version, it doesn't matter because your customer only knows what you tell them. Right? So a big part of competing as an independent designer in today's market is being able to manufacture right, the look and the feeling and the transparency that you want to be selling. Right? It's not that when you see someone's Instagram, you've got to sit there and you're like, oh my God, it's so like behind the scenes and it's so raw. And I actually had a client of mine who referenced Chanel when looking at Instagram and was like, oh my God, there's so much behind the scenes footage. And I was like, but do you realize that someone gets paid $75,000 a year to make it look 
as if it is raw and organic. I think their title is visual curator. Exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I remember like 15 years ago and people were becoming social media marketers and I was like, what the hell kind of job is that? <laughs> you know, like who gets paid to do that? And now it's like people get paid a lot of money to do that, right? So it's really interesting because these days the communication that you're putting out there, yes, it needs to be consistent. But the messaging and the brands that are selling and being successful are emerging market brands. So for example, take the brand Attico that's now being sold at net a at Bergdorf's, at Neiman's. They launched in 2016, right? And they're starting to see large scale distribution only one and a half years later, right? I think it was maybe end of 2015, early 2016. Another brand, Road Resort, right, started in 2014. They're now starting to see huge distribution, matches, right? International global brands or retailers are picking them up. Um, lots of independent boutiques around the cities. But they're starting to see volume coming into the millions, right, in terms of revenue. And these are brands that have not been around for that long, right? So oftentimes when we hear of the struggle, right, there tends to be this collective, like, what am I doing wrong? Or how do I make this work? Or you know, how do I actually improve upon what's happening? But really guys, the market is never more poised than now to be able to receive you as a young brand, right? The onus is really on you to craft that message, to have skin in the game, and to be able to really put forth a consistent brand that will get you sold. You know, have any of you guys participated in any trade shows? Is anyone thinking about doing trade shows? Right, okay. Trade shows, as you guys know, can cost a shit ton of money, right? It is not, it is not cheap to participate in a trade show. And in, in essence, a trade show is only as good as the work you put into the trade show itself, right? So I hear people asking me, are trade shows worth it, right? Should I be doing trade shows? And what I tell them is, do you have the investment and the capital to be able to do the trade show season after season for at least three or four seasons, right? Can you invest the $7,000 every season to do it? So these days, guys, it's really about having skin in the game. And a lot of the emerging market brands that are doing so well are making a commitment, right? It is guaranteed the first 18 months, 24 months of launching your business is going to be some of the most difficult experiences, both emotionally and from a cash flow standpoint, that you have to deal with, right? Because you're just not sure what's going to work. In this stage of your brand, you are working with a set of hypotheses. Right? Like, what is going to work? Who is my customer? And you're uncovering and discovering where that product market fit lies. Right? So when you guys are going to market and you've got your amazing samples and you're ready to go into production, remember that as a small brand, it is about the consistency over the next three to four seasons. Right? The buyers out there, even the consumers out there, are waiting to see how you're going to perform. It takes these days six customer touch points to get someone to convert. Six, that's a lot, right? Six touch points can mean anything from seeing things like an Instagram ad, a Facebook ad, maybe they're on your newsletter, maybe they visit your site, maybe they see you in a pop-up shop, maybe they see your product in a store. However you wanna slice up those six touch points, it takes time for a customer to convert. Has anyone tried Facebook ads? Yeah, okay, so if you've tried them and you haven't done it with strategy, you've probably thrown away your money, right? You're like, how do I do this the right way? I'm just gonna try with $5 a day. I'm gonna try with like $10 a day. Like, what's possible? Okay, so nothing is possible if you don't know what the hell you're doing, right? So it's like having the budget to put into these different strategies don't actually make a difference unless you've done some of the foregrounding. And that is what a lot of these emerging market brands are doing that are seeing a lot of success, right? It's not necessarily the amount of capital you're investing. It is the strategy that you spend to think about how you're gonna allocate that capital. So for a lot of creative brands that we work with and all the brands we work with, all the owners are like, oh, just diehard designers. And one of my favorite things to be is like the pain in the ass business person, right? I'm like, how are you spending your money? You know, where are you investing it? What's the ROI? And, um, and it's so fun to ask those questions, especially to a creative, because the answer is usually, I don't know, or I just put money in Facebook, you know, and I thought something would happen. Um, but to spend the time to educate yourself on the right segmentation of your dollars, right? The right segmentation of your markets, how to really extract the value and get yourself a 30 cent click through 
you know, CPC, right? It's like, it should be cheap. It doesn't have to be so expensive. And so as brands who are cash strapped and who are trying to figure things out on your own, you need to invest more time in education of the platforms that you're using and less time spending money on those platforms until you know what you're doing. Right? Otherwise, you hire a company like mine, and we do it for you. Right? But if you're bootstrapping it yourself, you really need to spend time in education. And that is what a lot of these brands are doing. The other thing these brands are doing that's so well is they are focusing on relationship building. It is not simple enough to just send an email out to a buyer once a season and say, hey, buy my shit. Right? It's, like, it's like inviting someone to a party and they don't know who you are. Right? It's like you need to have some connection, some relationship. They have to know who you are. They need to be something familiar to them. Right? Many of you guys showed up tonight because you're like, wow, Stitch Method, these guys are local. These are my like, hometown people. I know them. I want to show up to them. Right? I want to be there and be present with them. And I'm just kind of the kid from LA who's here. Right? But think about it in that same space as you're thinking about the retail buyers that you're potentially selling to. Right? How are you communicating with them and how are you able to consistently build that relationship season after season? How are you communicating with them when you have nothing to sell? Right? Do you only talk to them when you want to sell something? Or is there an opportunity for you to build those relationships now, even if you haven't launched yet? Build the relationships now so when it's time to launch, you already have friends in the game, right? You already have people who like you. And there's nothing better than having people in this crazy fashion industry, which can be so opaque and difficult to know what to do, than to have more friends, right? So that's the second thing that these brands are doing well, right? They are building relationships, right? And then the last thing is they're being really smart about cash flow. Have you guys heard about that brand, Monsieur Gabriel? Right, the handbag company? Okay. So these kids are based out of New York, right? And they've been around, I want to say, maybe three years at this point. They became huge on the scene with this bucket bag, right? It was like this big thing. And what they did, which was so interesting, is they went out and did trade shows. And in the trade shows, as opposed to like being so negotiable with all the people who wanted to buy from them, they held strong their payment terms. They were like, actually, you're going to put 50% down and 50%, you know, net 30 Right? And so being smart about your cash flow, because guys, businesses go out of business because there's no money. Right? So when you're thinking about building a business, you've got to think about how you're going to pay for stuff. You know, when you're launching a business now, you should ask yourself, do I have enough capital to consistently produce product like samples for the next three seasons if no one buys anything? Right? Imagine if no one buys anything. Can you continue to be in business for three more seasons? Because that is how long it takes in order to really see what's <laughs> going to happen. And you may get some orders here, some orders there. Some of you might be wildly successful out the gate month one. And some of you guys, it might take 18 to 24 months. Right? So you've got to be building business models that actually suit your budgets. And this time is so prime for alternative business models. So when you think about brands that are producing once a year, like Study New York, right? brands that are coming out with new collections every month, every three months, other brands that are producing on the traditional you know, three times a year, four times a year, can you believe it guys? There's like pre-spring, spring, high summer, pre-fall, fall, and holiday, right? It keeps you guys in business, right? <laughs> and resort, and resort. Let's not forget resort, which is before holiday. Um, so, you know, when we think about all the different times of year, right, the important thing to think about is not just how should I chase these markets, right? How do I fall in alignment to what currently exists, but more like how much money do I have to actually be able to create infrastructure that supports my cash flow? Right? So if that means you have to change up your business model and say, hey, I'm going to be producing once a year and I'm going to actually tailor my branding, tailor my marketing to create this image of a classic brand that produces once a year and this is our essence, no one's going to know any other. Right? People and markets and buyers and editors only know what you tell them. So this idea that you have to chase into an existing infrastructure is just not the case anymore, right? You have brands that are doing so well by setting their own terms. And as a young brand, having cash flow that lasts you, 
those amount of months, those seasons that actually help you figure out, hey, do I need to pivot or pursue, right? In the first 18 to 24 months, it's like, did I set this all up correctly, right? Do I pursue or do I have to make adjustments and pivot, right? You're kind of running like a startup. And I really, guys, I blame Silicon Valley and I blame Shopify for really making it seem like it's so easy to just get started, right? You guys know, right? There's no such thing as a minimum viable product in fashion, right? If it doesn't look good, it's just not gonna sell, right? If a website's shitty, no one's gonna buy from it, right? So it takes time and the capital to invest in the right things, right? And the right things are your visual assets, your photography, right? And I always say this, we all have friends of friends who can do things for us for free. Everyone has a cousin who builds websites, all right? Or like, <laughs> yeah, right? It's like everyone knows someone that can do some shit, right? The question is like, can they do it in such a way where it looks funded, right? Like, are these people producing assets that will actually elevate your company? Or is this just kind of like the best thing you can do? Because I tell you, if you're investing things and it's just, oh yeah, this person can do this for free and it's something as important as like photography or as important as your website development. Everyone knows a template when they see it, you know? It's like, a templates are amazing, but we know they're templates, right? It's like, it's just, it's the same cookie cutter. So you know what? Hire a designer, customize the front end, use that Shopify back end. You know, but like do like allocate your budget to areas of your business that are going to get the most impact, right? When you send emails out to retailers, emails out to potential press, to editors. I had a client who did so well for herself. She bootstrapped her whole launch. And before the site went live, she was written up in Forbes. She was written up in like the Austin business something or other. Inc. Magazine, and she bootstrapped it all herself, right? And it was because the emails that she crafted were all very branded, right? So when you think about how you're positioning yourself, right? It's like the cash flow element is really one of the most important, right? It's like, where are you spending money to best put yourself in the best light? And to be honest, guys, it's gonna be all your visual assets, all of your user experience, all of that is, is really critical. I can't tell you the number of websites I've seen that are trying to sell $600 jackets but look like it's a 99 cent site, mm -hmm. right? It's like, why would I ever buy something from that? And the one thing I always tell clients is like, you know what, you know if your stuff is shitty. You know, and it's like, we all try to say like, this is kind of what we have, like this is all we can do, but we know it, right? Like when we look on someone's Instagram and we're like, oh, I'm not gonna follow that person. I always tell people to look at your own Instagram. Would you follow yourself? You know, like would you follow your own content? Is it engaging? Is it interesting? Is there a unique point of view, right? So like think about it from the perspective of the consumer because oftentimes, as a brand, you're so in it and you're in the thick of it, right? You're so consumed with like, is my fabric coming in? You know, where am I landing with like my costing? How's my pricing doing? Oh my God, packaging, right? All these other things that we fail to step away and say, hey, if I was my own consumer, like how would I be engaging with this content? You know, and at the end of the day, guys, we are all content companies first. Right? We might be fashion businesses, we might produce product, but we are all media companies. Right? Every single one of us who's like alive is a media company, right? Instagram, Facebook. So how you choose to represent your brand is as critical as the product development that's gone into it. All right, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. So I don't think we ever like officially announced this in terms of our event invites, but we had this great idea of possibly doing what we are calling hot seats. So yeah. if anyone has any like burning sales, marketing, production, product development questions, maybe we'll use the chair that Catherine's in. Um, yes. Maybe come up, tell yes. us what your question is, keep it to a couple minutes, and then we'll answer for about 15 minutes. Can you talk to yourself? Yeah, let's do it. All right. We'll be really nice sometimes. And sometimes, you know, we're really here to give you our honest answer, right? So imagine if you were spending like $500 to ask a question, right? It's like, you know, like to be honest, because you don't want bullshit answers, right? But they're going to be meaningful, I promise. Okay, who wants to go? Don't be scared. <laughs> or we'll there start only calling on you. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, yes. Wait, if it come up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like this is a basic question, but like starting at like an Oxford shirt, what how much are we looking at for like a sample? Mm. What a little bit of this shit. <laughs> um, I'm curious, like traditional button down. Okay. Um, do you have a reference sample um, that you'd like the fit of or are you sure, reinventing like, the fit? Let's say I take an American apparel Oxford okay. and say basically this, just with my branding on it. Well, it's a little more complicated than us just like spinning out a number to you. <laughs> so you really have to get into many more details. So you need to do some, you know, shopping in your closet or in the store to see what kind of fabrics that you like. If you, I mean, are you thinking you're going to copy not only the fit, but the fabric of this shirt too? Um, we'll just say... Or do you not know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I haven't okay. thought through the question this well, time. I'm, I'm giving you homework. Okay. okay, so you need to shop for what kind of fabric you're looking for, what kind of buttons that you're looking for. Might be in a totally different shirt, it could be in a pair of pants you buy. Something that you like. You need to look for, um, I'm totally... Paparazzi, <laughs> don't worry, don't get <laughs> Men's shirting like that too, it's all about the details. So it's, right. you know, the you want to look at things like um, the placket. So what type of placket is it? Is it a separate pattern piece? Is it a placket that has where you're covering the buttons? Is it cut on the bias? Does it have a pocket? A the center front where the um, buttons go. Oh god, sorry. I have no idea about this. I'm sorry. <laughs> so all of these small details, like the there's interfacing, like in between the layers of the fabric. So do you like that stiff? Do you want it structured? Do you like it a little more soft? Menswear is really, really about these tiny details is what makes the difference from one button down shirt to the next, right? So I think in terms of like a cost for development, I mean, we'd still be going through the same fit process. <laughs> right, but you need to know all those details first before you can kind of get a number for that. Because mm -hmm. those, you have to purchase those items right. to sew up your shirt. Right. But are we looking like $2,000? Or are we looking like $12,000? Like To just sew one sample of your shirt? Sure. The typical price for going through like an industry standard, so if you have like, here's my sketch, and I want to go through the fit process that we described earlier, and have an end result fit sample that works well, is anywhere from 500, I would say, to 1500 per style. But it depends on the complexity. Mm -hmm. So if you have like, what I asked you, a reference sample that you want to call, follow for fit, you may be on the lower end of that scale. If you're reinventing the fit and you're doing some crazy, like one sleeve is way longer than the other, so you can wrap it around your neck and wear it as a scarf, <laughs> you know, then that might be the cool. higher end, right? <laughs> so then you're looking what at a longer like development What about like silk Oh wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're looking at like a, a longer development timeline, more details to work through to make sure that the thing works as a scarf. So I'd say anywhere from 500 to 1500, per style to go through that patterning sampling phase. Mm -hmm. But Jennifer's right, you have to consider, you know, the types of materials if you're using polyester, if you're using, you know, a higher end fabric from Japan. Just to back up a second but, too, that that's also like just the pattern of the sample. Yeah. Like you have to pay for all materials to get exactly. it done. Yeah. And the sketches which you can probably do, right? Yeah. You sketch a class. <laughs> <laughs> to get that done as well. So there's other like parts and pieces that go into getting that sample created. What about yes. like overages on fabric? So like, you know, obviously like the parts of the fabric get thrown away, right? So you have to buy more than what you think because it's like waste. It's This yeah. is like when you're manufacturing in like large quantities, you, your yields can kind of make or break yeah. your costing. So the yield is how much fabric it takes to make one garment. So if you're cutting like 10 pieces, you know, you're not buying that much fabric. Maybe you're buying 20 yards of fabric to make your button down shirt. If you're cutting 10,000 pieces, that's a different story, right? So you want to try to maximize your fabric usage when you're in production and get the best yield mm. by puzzle piecing all your little shirt pieces, sleeves, collars, cuffs in the most efficient way possible. Mm. And to back up like just a minute, when it comes to making a sample, every vendor has their own minimums. So I don't know if Jay is still here. Um, you can talk about every vendor, you have to order a certain amount of fabric. So you might just want to make one shirt, or your fabric vendor might say, you need to order 25 yards of that fabric. So that's right. another wow. big cost you have to factor into it. Yeah. 
Does can that ask, help? Is, that, is this helpful? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I ask a piggyback question? Yeah. This is both, I think, sales and production. So, like, Ralph Lauren started with ties, and, like, Chanel started with, like, hats. Like, we may have a vision for, like, a full women's wear collection or something, but that's not a realistic place to start. Do you have any, do you have any advice for, like, starting points, whether that be, like... Start small. I don't know so what a full like, yeah. collection means. If that's like a sixty-piece line, that's a yeah. You know, like a whole runway show. Like you may have like that vision, <laughs> but like you can't. St- oh but you my. can't start it like. Uh, but you Mercedes can't start Benz Fashion Week. <laughs> I mean, you can. It's it's kind of what um, Shama was saying in terms of like allocating your budget for marketing to the places that matter, right? So you're going to also have this budget for product development. So knowing you're spending five hundred to fifteen hundred just on the patterning and sampling to get that fit sample done out before you're even, you know, paying a factory to cut and sell or buying the production yardage. Uh, maybe it's like really picking your winners. Mm-hmm. Like what are my, do your gut test. Like what are my <laughs> best sellers? Like what do I really want to invest this What's product brand? Mm-hmm. Like cash flow in, like pick the winners, pick the heroes, <laughs> you know? And I would say go with those. And that's something that Jennifer and I have fun doing in terms of like our clients walking in the door with a large, Binder yeah. <laughs> of ideas, and we say, "Here's who, who we think are your heroes." Like we think this X, Y, and Z. And I'm also a really big fan of giving your target market or your customers a reason to buy everything, right? So if you have two items that are fairly similar, is your one customer going to buy both? If not, drop one. Like give them a reason to buy one of everything. So if someone comes to your website, they can literally add every single item to their cart and check out. <coughs> And it makes sense. So also, it goes back to development budget, right? So if you have an an item that has you know ten zippers and like custom snaps and all these things, drop it. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's too you, know, you want to go more simple, more clean design. Do all the custom stuff later. I echo. I mean, I think I think it's important to go nation specific and also to think about. How the brand's going to develop over time, right? So it's like your brand is like the pantheon, right? And it's like these collections are the like pillars, and you got to kind of like build things, like you know, yeah, you got to kind of build within the structure. I'm kind of waxing poetic here, but um, you got to build within the structure. So when you think about like, you know, launch with X, right? And you're like, all right, I want to go deep into a T-shirt, right? I would say like really think about if you're going to go big into a t-shirt or big into the shirt, you want to ask yourself, well, what would then be kind of the next logical step to build onto this in terms of developing the brand, right? And so what I want the brand to kind of stand for. And um, as far as like being narrow in the cash flow conversation, it is so critical, again, to kind of, you guys have great points, to, it's, it's so critical that if you do not have the money to produce next season, then you gotta rethink the first season. Right? Yeah, and it's work. like and you've gotta set you've gotta look at yourself and say, what's my overall budget and how am I slicing that up between all the different areas of my business? You know, I have some great clients that kind of did something similar to what you guys were talking about, which is here are all of my ideas and then let me talk to my product developers and manufacturers to really figure out what are the best products to go into each season, right? Like what makes the most sense from a cash flow standpoint, right? And then again, like I said, people only know what you tell them, right? So no one's going to know that you were choosing between like a hoodie and a crew neck, right? They're only going to know what you market. And I think that there's some brands that start with one item, like the ties that you referenced. We own ties. We do that so well. This is what we do. And they get known for that and they can sell them and they can make all the money and then reinvest and build, right? Yeah. And think about like bonobos. Right? It's like Bonobos launched revolutionizing the men's khaki. Even like Ruby Parker launched with the glasses, right? Now Bonobos went from specifically selling direct to consumer with the khaki, then it expanded, right? Then they started doing wholesale. So they started direct to consumer, they moved into wholesale. Now they have their own freestanding stores. I think this one, like, right? Is that, oh my God. And they also now are selling shirts and other products. So it's certainly possible to launch your business from like a line, like an item driven perspective and then build as opposed to collection driven, right? Which is like the right ratio of tops to bottoms, et cetera. I don't really think that there's one right way to do it. I think you've got to do that 
kind of check essentially of like what's right for you <coughs> and what's right in terms of your budget and all of these things. Like, you know, if you're really passionate about t-shirts, go for it. You know, if you're more passionate about like, I, I wanna see this visual collection and this is the story behind it, then that makes sense too, you know? So it's a little- Awesome, no, any, any other questions? Do other right. people wanna ask questions yeah. now? We're very gentle. <laughs> all right, sorry, you're out of the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have your hand up in the back. Yeah. Can you, can you come, come up to the front? <laughs> <laughs> did you have a glass of wine I did, or water? I did. I okay. two or three <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I'm launching my online in September, so mm. it'll be spring 2018. Um, sales is what like scares the shit out of yes. me. <laughs> I've been working like you guys for a long time, but sales is mm. different. So I need help there. I mean, and ideally, I'd like to hire a rep. I don't know if I'll find someone who will take me on in my first season. I've had some friends who said, why don't you want to sell yourself? I just, I'm a terrible salesperson. I've had so many retail jobs and I'm always the worst. Like I just, I don't know. My husband says I can't close. Like, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know what the deal is. So am I going to have to sell okay. myself? <laughs> so are you doing uh, direct to consumer online and wholesale or is it one or the other? I'm going to do both, but I really want to focus wholesale. You know, that's where I'd like to do the majority of my Amazing. sales. Great. Okay. So wholesale guys is a super awesome landscape to be in right now because right now retailers really need young and new interesting brands, right? Oftentimes you think about how difficult it is to get sold into a retail store, but really these retailers need to have cool shit on their Instagram. They need to be talking about newness. So it's really a great time for you to tap into lots of boutiques. Now, one strategy that I think is so valuable that so many people don't even think about is how amazing Yelp is. Okay. Right? Have you ever mm -hmm. gone on to Yelp and done research on like boutiques mm -hmm. or stores yeah. in a city? Yeah. Well, guess what? There are other stores that exist outside of Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and LA, mm -hmm. right? There are <laughs> lots of stores. <laughs> there are lots of stores that exist across the country. Right? So the first thing I'd say is like start with list building. Mm -hmm. Right? So you're not going to be able to pitch and sell unless you have a really nice robust list to kind of start pitching from. Mm -hmm. I personally like to say get about 250 stores on that list. Okay. Some might say less. I say go big. Right? Yeah. Like let's think about that. Mm -hmm. Before you start pitching to majors, and by that I mean like the Nordstroms mm -hmm. and the Bloomingdale's, etc., mm -hmm. you're really going to want to have a great back end. Right? So your operations, infrastructure, distribution center has got to be on point. So when you're just starting off, you probably may not want to be selling like a thousand units at a time right like can you handle that yes okay but <laughs> yes i can operations you got that okay got it oh my god amazing that okay go. so then in that case definitely include those guys on your list okay right? even right from first season. from the right from the beginning okay. because those guys okay. are not going to buy from you in the first season but they're going to keep an eye on you okay starting the first season Right, and again, it's about building relationship, mm -hmm. right? It's not about closing right away. Yeah. It's about getting to us. So different than like having someone walk into a store and you're trying to like reach a quota, mm -hmm. this is more like, imagine the person who's coming into the store like three or four times uh -huh. and they know you, yeah. right? And so yeah. they're interested in buying. So take that off the question. The next thing to kind of think about is how you're writing your pitch emails. Mm -hmm. Most people overthink this step way too much. I've had to edit down like a page, like five yeah. paragraphs. Let me tell you my life story. <laughs> Let me tell you where I came from, about the collection. Short and simple, confident and casual. Okay. Right? So yeah. when you think about writing these emails, you really mm -hmm. gotta think about like, hey, okay guys, let me tell you guys something. The best email that gets the best open rates sending to buyers is literally high exclamation point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. I love in the, hi. the subject <laughs> Yes, in the subject header. Really? Hi, <laughs> exclamation point. Because you know what? It's not a sales email, right? They're right. like, oh, who is this person? Like, oh, yeah. what's going on here? <laughs> right? And as soon as they like disarm themselves from thinking about you as someone who wants something from them, right? Mm -hmm. Automatically, psychologically, you've got yourself a little bit of an in, right? Mm -hmm. Then you kind of follow it up with like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. Right? Not like... Oh my God, even the most intelligent people who do this, hi, my name is, I'm like, no, your name is in the email right. subject. Like, they know who it's coming from. You don't need to tell them who you are, right? 
So, hey, how's it going? You know, like, I'm so excited to share with you my new collection or the new collection. Yeah. Right? Like, here's what we're doing. Here are the price points. Mm -hmm. If you have some press, here's where we've been featured. Here's what we're producing. Mm -hmm. Here's a link, right? Don't send heavy weighted attachments, okay. right? Like, here's a link to my look. Like my my like, lookbook. Exactly. Okay. Just like keep it short, right? It mm -hmm. should be like literally an opening three sentences, three to four bullets, and then a closer. Okay. Right. So, as a former buyer, I can tell yes. you this <laughs> shit works. Okay. Perfect. Like, this shit works. Um, and then link out, right? No heavy attachments. Okay. Now, lastly, this kind of all comes back to the fact that, yes, you will be selling your collection. And um, the reason why is that even the best showrooms, mm -hmm. right, will want to find out from you what's your existing distribution like. Yeah. What's in it for me, right? Like, yeah. where are you selling? Um, what percent did you short ship last season? Yeah. What are your best sellers? You know, mm -hmm. they want to know all that information, right? Mm -hmm. So the best showrooms are the ones who are going to grill you yeah. before they take you on, right? And that is yeah. a good thing because that means that they only want to take on brands that they know can do well, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. if you continue to persevere, even if you get into a couple doors, mm -hmm. Right, which might seem right now like, holy shit, how do I do that? But it's a lot easier than you think, right? Okay. And it's like, you gotta take it casual and confident. Uh -huh. Then the right showrooms will be more attracted to taking you on. Okay. Right, because they're gonna see that, yes, you can ship, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. yes, you can ship on time. Mm -hmm. You are building these relationships, yeah. right? And you understand that in order to be taken seriously, you don't have to try so hard, Yeah. right? It's kind of like telling someone like, I'm so cool, and you're like, oh my god, that person is so not cool, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, it's kind of like that, right? Yeah. You're not going to pitch them and be like, oh my god, I'm, I'm trying to tell this stuff. It's like, no, hey, like we're on the same level here, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. We're both in the market to provide the right product at the right time for the right customer, mm -hmm. right? Something I learned a very long time ago in the buying office at Macy's. It's never going to shake me, but, um, but that is something you really want to take to heart, right? You guys are on the same page. You're on the same level. Mm -hmm. This might be your first time starting this particular brand but as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. you might start multiple brands yeah you know this might be one of five yeah. right like you might have this one forever who mm -hmm. knows I love that you're saying that I know <laughs> yeah it's so. like it's, it's it's so critical yeah. to think about this is like hey I'm an adult I have life experiences I'm not mm -hmm. like you know at your mercy in right. some sense you are but you don't have to acknowledge that right? <laughs> yeah. um, but be casual and confident Okay. You know, and so sales is really about faking the funk. Okay. You know, right. and then have the right images, have the right branded assets. Mm -hmm. Don't give them a reason to look at your stuff and say, "Ooh, like, uh, that doesn't look right." Mm -hmm. You know, like do do that kind of gut check. You know, do the arm check. Yeah. With your, like, <laughs> with, it works with your I website. Have a, a follow up question then, because you were saying yeah. like the six touch points for your mm. consumer to convert the sale. Yeah. What about the buyer? Like yes, how many yeah, yeah. should she mm. reach out? To the oh my god, all the time. Should okay. I now, before I even have product, I have no images. Okay, when can I? Okay, so you gotta have something. Okay. You gotta have okay. like <laughs> something. You don't have to have everything, mm -hmm. right? And it's so, so I could cool. even send be like, could I send an image before I do my photo shoot? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it's so cool. I did an event with Condé Nast in in New York, like maybe a month ago, and. This is more on the editor side, but it does translate. And mm -hmm. so some of the editors were on a panel together, and it was so cool, I was hosting. I was like, yes, <laughs> um, And we were talking about like what gets them interested in emerging market brands, mm -hmm. you know? And they were like, we love it when people send us emails and are just like, hey, will you take a look at this? Like, what do you okay. think? You know, uh -huh. like, what do you think? Yeah. You know, it's not, there's no commitment. Mm -hmm. There's no pressure. They're not trying to get something out of them. Mm -hmm. Right, but what do you think? You know, and especially if you have some dream stores that you're really interested in, it's like pitch the assistant buyer, you know, mm -hmm. like ask her like, hey, I'm developing this collection is what we're doing. Here's the branding. Remember, if you have a website, they're going to go to the website. If you have an Instagram, they're going to go to the Instagram. Mm -hmm. So do not push those things live unless you're ready for people to see them. Okay. Right? They're already live. Okay. So, so <laughs> like, okay. I do the gut check, yeah. like, are they good enough? Um, <laughs> But you know, like do not drive traffic unless you're ready to receive, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So make sure those are up to par, right? Okay. Even yeah. as you're like in the process of getting your photography and your lookbook mm -hmm. together. But definitely rely on the goodwill of people who are very influential, like an assistant buyer mm -hmm. or the buyer of a small boutique to give you their feedback and get yeah. into their good graces. Okay. You know, and to answer your question about the six touch points, yes. I mean, it takes 
multiple times of pitching. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, guys, there aren't just like a couple times a year when you're in market. You guys are in market like all the flipping time. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times buyers are looking for ATS? So they're looking for immediates. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, what do you have on stock? You know, what do you have on hand? And so many of you guys are so stressed out about, I got to place this inventory. What am I going to do with the inventory? And yes, you should know what you're doing with inventory when you place your orders. But know that a lot of times these days, you're finding a lot of retail buyers who are so into this, like, buy now, wear now. Yeah. Right? They want to buy closer to the seasons. Mm -hmm. right? I had a client of mine who got bought, had her collection bought by Neiman's in January for a spring delivery. Right? Yeah, exactly. And you're like, how do I say no to Neiman? You yeah. know, like, oh my God, like, what do I do? Luckily, she had inventory on hand, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to ask yourself, like, what are the ways in which I'm using that inventory? And then think about it, like, hey, yes, there are a couple different times during the year where you're in market, mm -hmm. but then there's like every other day of the year where it's an opportunity to like touch base and like get to know your buyers and to tell them that you have immediates and you love to talk to them about the collection. Mm -hmm. And until someone writes you and says like, stop emailing me, <laughs> <laughs> you have license to email okay. because every buyer who has the privilege of being a buyer, mm -hmm right knows yeah. that they will be pitched to okay right yeah. so do not feel bad this is like par for course right okay. like as a former buyer pitched all the time now whether or not you respond it doesn't mean that it's a, if you don't respond it's not a no mm -hmm. it's just like a not right now or I haven't even opened it you know mm -hmm. and so for that I actually suggest using methods like streak or boomerang to help track your emails okay mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. did that person really open my email or not? You know, mm -hmm. like, did that buyer open it but not respond? Or did they not open it at all? Uh -huh. Right? In which case, I'm going to resend them that email. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> anyway, that was a very long answer to no, your very great. short Thank question. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Are there any other questions? We don't have to do hot seats, but any, any questions? I kind of like the hot seats. You do? Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of into it. It's really fun. Yes. Well, do you want someone? I'm going to piggyback off of what we were talking oh, yeah. about. Like, people are people, right? We're connecting with them. Nobody wants to talk about their job 24-7. If you have a conversation with them, talk about their family. Talk about what they like. Because that email that you're sending to them six days later can be the, oh, how was your event last night? Oh, where did you go over Memorial Day weekend? Like, being able to connect with someone and just bring up something different that they then remind, remember that, oh, they were super nice. I totally connected with them. It's like another way to like get in the door. Yeah, we always hear that you do business with people you know, like, and trust. Yes. Yeah. So if you can get them to like you. <laughs> Which means like not stalking them on LinkedIn, right? Like remember guys, people are on LinkedIn to get jobs, okay? So like, like do not like harass them on LinkedIn. And another good tip for finding emails is uh, hunter.io. I expect to see like phones out, people writing this. <laughs> um, this is like, yeah, yeah write it down. Hunter.io. Okay. Yes. And that allows you to, I see people, good, phones are out. Um, and that allows you to basically look up a person who you would find on LinkedIn and insert the company that they work for and see with a certain percent of relevancy, like what that email address would look like. So it's like, we are 90% sure. This is the person at Bergdorf Goodman. You should be pitching to them, right? You're like, yes, I am going to pitch to that person, right? So, um, so technology, here's what's super cool, is like technology on the Silicon Valley side, on the like Salesforce and like tech side, is doing so many cool things, right? And yet, like in the fashion industry, we're still kind of like bridging and like finding ways of like bringing over these technologies. but. Things like Hunter.io, Boomerang, and Streak, et cetera, Rob, it's not intended for the fashion industry, but there are so many cool tech applications that can be used in our industry that we really gotta take advantage of them before they become a little more closed off, you know? Anyway, pot seats. Come. Yes, come. Hi, well, I'm already working with Abby and Jennifer on oh, Dress Life for Women, so you know how when you're a busy professional woman, maybe with kids and you don't have all day to be at the mall shopping for exactly what you like. Um, we are creating uh, three core dresses 
that can be um, customized based on what color you want. And um, right now we're starting with um, your sleeve length. So either you want it short sleeve or you know, no sleeve, a cap sleeve, or a three quarter sleeve. And the question I wanted to ask is, and I haven't, we haven't talked about this yet, but I was just like, <laughs> I actually, so I've, I, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and I've worked um, as a CPA there for 28 years, and so I know a lot of people now, and I've just been like killing myself just trying to get to know like everyone in Columbus, you know, and one of my friends is an ex-buyer of, at Macy's, and um, I was talking to her this past week about, you know, before we launch, doing like a launch party with, you know, just inviting a ton of women to see like a small line, or you know, if we had like say 20 dresses, they could try them on, and do like a pre-order thing, because what, one of the thing I'm, things I'm kind of thinking about is what we're gonna order, because we are giving people choices in their sleeves, so how are we gonna know, doing? yeah, how are we gonna know when we first launch what to have in stock, you know, like I don't know if you're gonna want a size 10 with a, you know, short sleeve or, or what. So, uh, what do you think about like a pre-party mm. where they can understand that it's gonna be ordered in advance? You know, it's not gonna come like tomorrow. It's gonna come in a month or something. And okay, questions. What's your price point? Around 175 ish. Okay. Yeah. And how many levels of customization are there? Right now, just the sleeve. And okay. You mentioned color as well, though. Right? Color, sleeve, and color. Yes. Okay, great. But we don't know how many colors yet. <laughs> <We're really laughs> that. Yeah. And what's the lead time to production? Six weeks? Four weeks? I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a big there. question. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, it's kind of a loaded question because yeah. if we do a launch party, we could get prepared in terms of like having things ready to order. I think if we haven't ordered anything. So having ordered fabrics through production, I think two months is pretty solid. Okay, so two months is a long time to get someone to buy a pre-order, right? Two months is kind of like, maybe like the longest, right? So I would actually say like, in terms of getting market feedback, if you wanna think of this more as a, you know, focus group hangout party where you get people's vibes, mm -hmm. Right, I would say would be like the best way to think about this. It's exactly what I was gonna say as well. Yeah, like how, like, <laughs> it's a good vibes thing, right? So like, let me get a bunch of women in a room. I had a client of mine who did this and it was really great because what she did is she printed out little note cards and she just had people like walk around, try things on. There was champagne, which was great, um, some snacks. And at the end, people like wrote their comments, what they liked, what they didn't like, and they kind of put them in a little box. And at the end, she had all this great anonymous feedback. Right, and the anonymous feedback is amazing because if you invite any of your friends, they're gonna be like, "Oh, I'm gonna like tell you the best things ever," right? Yeah. But if someone's really given the opportunity to like say what they think anonymously, it's a great way to get people who are close to you and people who don't know you so well to really open up, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of doing a pre-launch party is great, but I would reframe this, right? Like reframe this and think about this as having influential women who are in your target market who are getting together for wine, for champagne, to really experience the product and make them feel like they're a part of this process. Like I really value your opinion because you are someone who I believe would be like the target market for me and it is so important for me to understand what's really gonna work for you, right? And so you kind of reframe this into something where it's like, you know, you are putting them up on a pedestal, right? Like I want your opinion. Okay. And so come by, check it out, have like, definitely make sure you have enough size runs, yeah. you know, for things that people are going to try on. No one wants to wait, yeah. right? And ask them questions about the fabric. Ask them questions about the fit, about the length, right? About how that shit feels in the armpits, you know, like yeah. stuff like that, you know? I think especially about the color in that mm. piece too, because that could help you sort of, what's my most popular color going to be? Should mm -hmm. I buy it in the more of that yardage? Because in this scenario, you haven't purchased your production yardage right. yet then you can purchase, you know, with a plan. So not taking orders that night, basically I just wouldn't take orders. feedback and- Just feedback, and anonymous order. feedback. Okay. Right, Depression. and then you take that yeah. feedback, you take it yeah, back to these right. guys, and you're like, hey, here's what I got. Like, I like now, the anonymous part. Yeah, because, like now yeah, how do I do it? your face, like, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know what, you don't want to know it either, right? It's like, yeah. they don't want to say it, you don't want to hear it, right? right it's right, better right. to like, take the people out of this process and be like, hey, like you guys are valued and trusted. 
and I wouldn't have you, I wouldn't invite you and woo you with all this great stuff if I didn't really want you to be honest with me. Okay. Right? And so like think of it as a focus group and then if you do decide to do pre-sale ever, right, really keep your delivery windows within six weeks. Okay. Right? So like if you're going to pre-sell, like think about like a six week turnaround time for getting product. You know, Moda Operandi launched their whole business model on pre-selling, but now even those guys have inventory and have like a full online shop. Yeah. Right, so it's like people want stuff. Right? See, this would be more for helping us make an intelligent decision for about what buying to inventory. Buy when we do launch exactly. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. <laughs> Sorry, I actually have an idea for her. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think this is a stupid idea, but instead of asking for sales, you could always have them sign a guest book, and you can say yeah. if you're interested in joining my newsletter or whatever, leave your email, and then you could tell them, hey. I launched. Here's my stuff. Totally. Totally. Yeah. 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 Or you so that you can still go back to them and be like, "Were you interested?" Take that a step further and give away a free dress. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. And get all the business cards with all the emails, and then you can start building your list. Okay. You know, and just one free dress is that worth it? You know, to yeah. start building the list yeah. of the attendees or something raffles. It doesn't even have to be a dress. Mm -hmm. It could be a gifted, sponsored prize. Yeah. I, I, I tell people who yeah. are in that business, <laughs> you know, and I think they're too. finding. Yeah. That the optimum like pre sell you gotta deliver in two or three weeks. Okay. I don't think you can I don't think two months is viable at all. Yeah. Okay. Alright, more hot seat. Yes, come on up. Come on up. Thank you. Um, so I am launching in January, yes. spring 2018. Yes. Um, direct to customer mostly. Mm. Um, but uh, trying to get a goal, our goal is to get into um, about three stores. Oh, wow, great. So just to, that's our goal, but um, just trying to get uh, product ready to sell directly to customers. So right now we're putting together our, um, our website um, and I, we're trying to decide what we want, what the content should be on that mm -hmm. website until we launch. Like great what question. types of teasers, yes. how much information should we give, um, what should we hold back, Yes, okay. So um, so the question was like what do we you know, what do we have on the website before it launches, right? Like how do we do that? So okay. So you don't want to give everything away, right? right? Of course. But you also it's direct to consumer, so you wanna give people kind of a taste or an idea of what you're up to, right? So your about statement, mm -hmm. super important, right? Like how you choose to write about your brand, write about yourself, you know, all of that is really critical. Number two, don't have a ton of images. Right now you're looking, like before you launch, you're looking at really a splash page. Okay. Right, it's like maybe it's two pages, right? Maybe it's like a home page with some like great images and then you have an about section and a contact section, right? Maybe it's three pages, but keep it very minimal. Okay. Most of my clients launch with just a splash page, right? It's like okay. something that has a strong call to action in terms of getting customer emails and acquisition, right? Because mm -hmm. that's really important. Um, and also something that's a, like a brand statement, right? Like here's what we're doing, here's where we're launching, etc. Again, since you're going to do this now and it's not launching for another six months, mm -hmm. right? I would steer clear of like trying to keep up with the website, right? So normally I'd say every month you need to change your homepage, you need to kind of keep up with traffic and make sure your content is kind of matching that. But in this beginning stage, I would say like keep it, keep it kind of simple. Okay. You know, like don't don't overdo it. Make sure. Are you launching with social right now? Uh, yes. What what channels are you launching with? Um, we're just starting to talk with a company that's going to help us. Soch. I don't know if you've heard of Soch. Nope. They're out of Milwaukee, um, and they're all about launching brands with social media. Great. Did they tell you what kind of channels? They're, they're thinking for us, because of our um, demographic, that Facebook is going to be a really good fit they for us. Too, yeah. mm -hmm. What's your demographic? Um, women who are 40 to 60, but Facebook. are... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Facebook is where you want to be. Um, and and with Facebook, right? So here's really this is actually a really great learning point. So okay. like, when you hire an agency to do anything for you, mm -hmm. right? You want to make sure that you're well versed in the topic enough to know when they're talking shit and when they're like really adding substantive value, right? So like even though you're like, oh my God, these guys seem like a godsend, right? Mm -hmm. They're so used to dealing with like execution. 
You know what I mean? Sometimes the bedside manner is not so good, right? Right. In terms of explaining, right? And so agencies can sometimes get into this pattern of like, we're just good at what we do, hand this it over. But at the end of the day, you might be looking to internally bring on someone to do social media for you in like a year, right? Right. Or in six months or nine months. And how on earth will you know what's working and not working, right? right? So as you look to take on other agencies to help you do work, make sure that you're kind of actively involved in like, how are you guys targeting? Okay. You know, like, why did you choose not to do that? Right? Like, what should the cost per click look like here? Okay. You know, and like, why is it coming in like this? Right? And ask a lot of questions because the most intelligent people ask the most questions. Okay. Right? It's like, and never feel like you shouldn't ask a question because you think it's like, I should know that. Either you should Google it, mm -hmm. right? Or you should definitely ask them because it is their job to educate you on what you're paying them to do. Right. Okay. Right. Cause you're the boss. Uh -huh. Right. And sometimes when you hire other people who are experts, it can feel like, Oh, well I'm just going to entrust in them. Right. And yes, definitely entrust in them. You hire experts for a reason, but the educational element of this is so critical because as a brand owner, the goal eventually is to have a team in house, right? Right. A team you can manage a team where, social media becomes organic and you have, you know, your person on the side is like, yes, I'm like photographing that and posting it and, you know, it becomes more robust. So right. train yourself now for the future brand, right? And work with them as if you're on the same level, even though you may not know. It's just a different language, right? Right. Whatever you are an expert in, you'd be able to explain it to someone else, right? Right. right. So when you're hiring these other people, make sure they can also do the same for you. Okay. Great. I don't even know what your question was. What was Just your question? The website. Oh, right? <laughs> uh, sorry. You did answer. Right? <laughs> the splash page. Yes. Sorry. But the about section you kind of touched on yes. a little bit. So yeah. do you think it's sorry. just a splash page or a landing page to get emails now? Or is it that and an about? Mm. Or when does the about okay. section come so in? So like your about section is so valuable, right? Because your about section is going to go in your Facebook like profile, right? It's like this is where you're doing the most. Like you need to have a brand voice person, if it's mm -hmm. not yourself, who right. comes in and helps you figure out, we say made in the USA with like a dot after the U and the S and the A or without that, you know, like we talk like this, but not like that. And the mm -hmm. worst thing you can do for your brand is just start up organically, right? Because it ends up becoming like a spider web where you have all these factions of content that are out there. And all of a sudden, six months from now, you're like, oh my God, I'm on all these channels. I'm saying all these different things. What is really home base? For the company gotcha. right so your brand statement and your about section are the foundation of everything else just like your website is the umbrella for all the other content that comes back to it right it's all rooted in your website gotcha great stuff i'll thank you you're welcome <laughs> do you want to do a quick break or just keep going i mean i'd like some more wine I'd like some more wine, but I can keep going. I just, I just need, I need a little fuel. I need a little fuel for my, oh, my function. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Okay. I, I have you brought <laughs> <laughs> Yes, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Are you writing things down? I mean, you know, you gotta keep up. You gotta, like, you know. <laughs> All right, yes. Hi. So, um, I have a few questions. Oh, shit. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to piggyback off her question before about the buyers. What are some good questions to prepare for? Oh my before? God. Yes. Okay. So if any of you guys are thinking about selling wholesale, this is a good thing to listen to. Okay. So a buyer meeting will last you like 10 minutes. It's like super fast. They want to see the collection and then they're going to ask you some specific questions, right? So like, where's your distribution set? Like, where are you shipping out of? Okay. Right? Like what percent did you short ship last season? Right? Meaning like did you ship all the products that you had orders on? Right? They want to know if you're ready to handle volume. Okay. Right? Like are you ready to take them on? What are your best sellers? If you don't know what your best sellers are, if you've been in business like two seasons, 
but like you're in your second season and maybe you don't really know what they are, so you can make them up. Yeah, of course. Right? This one's so popular and gray right now. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's, totally, it's like, just make it up, right? No one knows what your best sellers are but you, right? right? So, so make sure you have that. They're also gonna ask you about, about fit. Okay. They're gonna ask you about how th- about next season. So what do like, you mean by fit? like like how do these things fit? You know, how are they supposed to be worn? Like, true to size? Not true. Yeah, flowy, relaxed okay. fit. Uh, okay, you okay. know, true to size depends on the country you're in. Right. Okay. Right. Sure, it's yeah. like that French thirty eight is different than that Italian sure, thirty eight. Right. Sure. So um, I know. Right. <laughs> um, bad experiences in the dressing room. <laughs> but. Um, but before, before you keep going, yeah. back to distribution for a second. So, you know, all of our, most of our designers are just starting. Yeah. So their distribution is their house. Yeah, so like, totally. So you can fake the best seller thing, but how do you fake the best Right. Oh my God. Okay. So all you have to do is call your house a studio. Okay. What if they want to visit you in your studio? No one visits you in the studio. <laughs> Nobody, nobody, nobody's gonna visit. No one's gonna check out your shipping. Like, trust me, right? No one has time to do that, right? But they want to know that you know that you need to have them, right? So you can say it's your studio. What I always tell my clients is like, call a couple like real distribution centers that are local to you. Get a couple names, you know. So when you're like, oh, I, I ship from my studio, but I'm in relationship with such and such distribution center when we scale. Okay. Right? That's so it basically perfect. tells that you're not lying, right? You're just kind of saying like, hey, if and when we scale, we already know who we need to be in touch with. Sure. Right? So that's really important. But they also want to know about next season because a lot of buyers are thinking about continuity. Right. Right? So think about it like this. At the end of December, if everything's on markdown, it's January, it's like the dregs of the product, you know, Feb 15, March 1, spring's rolling around. It's very likely that your spring is going to be sitting next to your markdown fall. Sure. Right? So, like, what's the continuity there and what's the differentiator? Okay. Right? So, they want to see that you have vision and they want to know, like, what your long term game is. Okay. Right? Now, every buyer is going to ask you for a discount. Right? Every si- almost every single one. Right? And they're going to range between, like, you know, 8% to 17%. Okay. You know, some of my clients right now who are now shipping with, um, Matches, right? They're asking for 17% discount. Okay. That's a lot. That is a lot. But you know what? They're raking in the dough. <laughs> so that's okay, right? And it's like their margins are already okay. But you should know kind of what you have at your disposal to give away as a discount. Okay. Right? If someone says 12, you can say, what about 8? And you can land on 10. So if a product, let's say your price on your website is like a hundred dollars for a top okay and then you're gonna sell it to wholesale to a buyer it would be 17 percent off of that yeah i would say like think about when you think about your pricing i think pricing is like a huge conversation right sure. it's like your pricing needs to be based off of your branding Right, so it's like don't base your pricing off of what it costs right. to produce, right? So you have your pricing, and then I would say take like a 2.5, you know, so divide that retail price by a 2.5, and that should be your wholesale price. Okay. Now, between your wholesale price and your cost price, should be the biggest margin you can possibly get. Okay. Right? I'm not a fan of like take your cost price, double it, get your wholesale price, double it. You really need to get the biggest margin you can. Now, in the sure. beginning stages of your brand, you might find that your cost price and your wholesale price are kind of like inching up against each other. Thank you. Um, are kind of inching up against each other, and that's going to be the risk of like being a new business and kind of starting off like that. Right. Um, but you should be able to intelligently negotiate, right, with right. your buyer. Right. But the very first meeting you have with a buyer is going to be really about getting to know you getting to know about how the market is receiving your product. Mm-hmm. So if you have bloggers, if there are influ- if there's anyone who's kind of interested in your product, you're going to want to talk about that. Sure. You know? Um, okay, and then, so if you're in contact with buyers, um, let's say a bigger retail, um, would they be buying, you know, pieces for one store, or would they be like, okay, this is going to be for... All of, I don't know, usually it's one store. So they're okay. usually so going to test you out. Okay. They're going to test you out. So the way, ones? so the way that, yeah. So like the way, like for example, a large company like a Macy's or a Bloomingdale's work is they have 
their stores tiered out, like A stores, B stores, C stores, D stores, right? D stores are like every door in the country. Okay. And your A stores are your top performers, right? And so like Herald Square would be like above the A, right? It's like on its own main like top performer. And then they kind of tier it out by that. Okay. So usually, I have a client who's in Hawaii who's selling really locally to the Nordstrom's that are in Hawaii, yes. right? And she hasn't yet broke the like US mainland distribution. Right? And who's to know she will? Because right now buyers are buying based on segmentation. Right? So they do things like regional pricing. So sometimes they'll find that stores will like price depending on like, now we're getting like real retail nitty gritty, but they'll price depending on the region. Okay. Same with distribution. Okay. Right? So they're going to distribute based on that. Usually they'll give you a test in like one store and then they'll start to roll you out. That's a really good <laughs> yeah, of course. Anything else? Yeah, but I don't remember. Oh, come on! Okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll keep thinking. Yeah, keep thinking. I want to just add one thing. When we, you, I mean, you don't have to be on here for it, but when um, I was working in girls' dresses, it was mass market, and we were selling them Macy's and JCPenney and Kohl's, and every one of those buyers would ask for a different, for a discount, right? Oh, my God, yes. And so we would redesign some things ever so slightly for the ones with the deepest discounts. Mm. So it, it's a girl's little dress, right? So holiday, so JCPenney wanted it for X price. We can do that for you without this flower trim on it. You know, mm. so we still yeah. buy it without the flower trim. So it's reducing like our cost of goods. That is so smart. To negotiate a little bit. Brilliant. They're happy, we're happy. You still get the order. So that's something you could consider too in terms of if, if you have those options available in your garment to say that we can absolutely do that for you. Here's one tweak I would make to, to make that price work for everyone. Mm -hmm. but, but you can also hold your ground and say, yes, I'm sure you can. That's a yeah. We don't negotiate the yep. center price. Yeah, absolutely. Which is close to the, the people who uh, wanted the 50% up front. Yeah, you can hold your ground. Yeah, but here's, here's an important thing is if you hold your ground, you've got to have something to back it up. So like when you think again about the branding, you know, I like to call it perceived value, right? So like every buyer, every consumer evaluates your brand and walks away with a certain kind of perceived value of the brand, right? So you have to maintain that level of branding, either it's exclusivity, whatever the perceived value is that you're projecting, you've got to make sure you're nailing it if you want to be able to play a hardball. Okay. Right? Because they have to walk away feeling like, oh, I want that. Right? Like, oh, this person's already crushing it. Like, I want that. You know? Yes, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> yeah, this might be a little obscure. Oh, well, it's, it's more general. So, Obscure and general? Yeah, obscure and general. Because I'm, I'm not really a fashion person. I'm, I'm a car designer. So, um, and I, but it's, it's the same thing. It's emotional. Um, mm. uh, connection with something. So, how do you build a brand when it's being built upon the behind the scenes and that like theory driven thing? So, imagine if you were a designer who was going to make your brand all about like I'm showing you what's underneath this, and a lot of your media has to do with like the process. Mm. But the problem is when you're in any of these things, cars or or um, clothing. It takes a long time. Like yes. the artist has to work a long time, mm -hmm. and it's usually scatterbrained, and you can't really manage that media very well. So, mm -hmm. like, how could you build a banner on that, like, and yeah. actually deliver on those things? Like, you know, if you have, like, I mean, a time constraint that, like, I, I don't know if I can make it two weeks. Like, that's hard to figure it out. <laughs> you know? mm. um, and then, because I think you talked about how stuff can become a spider web, and it mm. uh, it loses people. So, you know, in selling um, anything, um, and it has to be this kind of progressive, continual um, reminder of who you are, you know, what, what are things that you can do? Oh my God, it's a great question. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people love a good story, right? That's what I was just yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> people love a good story. The, yeah. the, the question comes in is like, who's curating the story, mm. right? As the artist, you may not be the best person to curate your own story. Okay, yeah. Right? So like if you are deep in the design, development, and like ideation, and you are the artist, right? There's a reason why artists have managers. 
Yeah. Right? It's because they do a shit job of telling the story. <laughs> right? Like, they need someone to, like, upsell their stuff. Right? They're like, I've uh -huh. just been slaving away at this for a month. I don't know what it's worth. But I've been, you know, working yeah. on this for so long. And most of the time, right? they're still critiquing it. Right? Exactly. Ready, so. exactly, right. exactly. Exactly. So are you the best person to be telling your story? Mm. Right? That's like mm -hmm. the number one question. Number two, mm. people love the good story. Right? So if you can craft the story, and for you, as far as like showing what's underneath the hood, if you will, mm -hmm. it's going to be about imagery. Right? So it's mm -hmm. going to be about how hiring the photographers to come in to take the right photographs of the process. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And it's having someone who actually knows how to use the iPhone seven in the right way <laughs> to take the photograph and not just like snap some photos with flash on. Right. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you need to think about how the story is being curated mm -hmm. and then also think about content management. Right. This is a huge topic. Right. Content <laughs> management spans not just what you produce on social media, but how things like your website flow into your social media, how things like your newsletter flow into your website, flow into your social media, yeah. and so on and so forth, right? So when you think about content management, you've gotta be thinking about what is the content calendar? What is the story that I'm disseminating across all the channels that I want to be on mm -hmm. right now? And do I have the right person to execute visually and verbally to tell that story? That allows you to be the artist, yeah. right? To have someone who can come in and have that perspective mm -hmm. to do that storytelling fully gives you the license to say, I'm just gonna like work yeah. on this stuff, yeah. right? And so that, that's important because oftentimes as a new designer, as a new brand, we tend to think again that we can do it all ourselves. The problem is it does take a team. Yeah. If you're hiring these guys to do your production, you've got a team. Right? If you're working with me, you've got a team. If you're working with anyone else, you've got a team. You can't do this right. without a team. Yeah. Right? So you have to think about who's going to be your content curator. Hmm. No, that's really right? good. I also yeah. like the perspective of when you're, when you're building and you're developing and you're working on this behind the scenes and you don't have a product yet, you still want to be extending this invite to your potential customers, mm -hmm. to your party. Yeah. Right? Your party being, totally. when I launch my brand, doors open, ready for sales. So if you aren't working on this behind the scenes brand building, storytelling, content, what was your buzzword? Management? I don't know. So I have a buzzword. Better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, content, storytelling, right? The flow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Simultaneously while you're yeah. developing and sourcing and producing, mm -hmm. and you open your doors and you're like, everybody come to my party and nobody's here. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. This is your invite. It's like an engagement thing. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Way of engagement. You're awesome. building buzz. Building yeah. buzz. Yeah. Follow up? Follow up. Do you have a follow up question? Do I have a follow up oh. question? <laughs> um, to that about branding building. Uh, I think, um, oh, I think something that I had talked about before was uh, I had this idea of how interesting would it be to involve something that is not normal, like take cars, because that's my world and then um, build lifestyle that's non-cars. And um, what are ways that you can, oh, that's right. How can you find your market with that? So if I'm dealing in a market of like car shows, you have like this older generation and this newer generation that's not exactly connected with it. Like, how do you even find that and even get in touch? Is it going to the stores and like talking to those boutiques and like seeing like, who comes in here and like, does this relevant? Okay, you guys go. Yeah. Well, you go. Uh, okay, I'm like, <laughs> so excited. So, so like, what do these people consume? Mm, yeah. Okay. No, no, tell me. What do these people consume? <laughs> that was like no, a question. Really question. <laughs> what do they consume? Um, that's a very good question. And I'm where sure. do they consume yeah. what they consume? Yeah, that would probably have to be the first thing to identify. So if I were to talk about the market that I want to be in, um, it would be the millennial generation that consumes... Uh, urban Outfitters type clothing or like whatever that like new trendy thing is or actually no let's talk about the older generation person who wants to be younger and they get the Porsche and go to the meets and they try to be hip. That's your person because they have the deeper person. pockets. Yeah. Exactly. Deeper pockets. They're not so the college student. Yeah. <laughs> go That's for the, the money. Thing. Yeah go for the money. Exactly. And they're right now into the hot stuff because they're like the Porsches are hot and that's where the shows go. And um, 
And so they're into the indie stuff, so they'll they'll go after Spotify, they'll go after um, whatever that like Squarespace-y kind of world is. Mm -hmm. Um, specifics? I, I'm not sure that's a good question. So like, what's super cool is as you start to discover who these people are, like mm -hmm. these people, you need to be doing, to borrow from my husband here, you need to be doing some ethnographic research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> into, yeah, I don't know where he is, but into, um, into these people's worlds, right? Yeah. Here's like the most whacked out stuff that I see. I want to design for that market, but I know nothing about them, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know what they're into, and it's not me, I don't have friends, people like that. Yeah. Like, I just have an idea <laughs> of what they are, and I think I want to sell to them, mm. right? That's a surefire way to spend a lot of money real fast and not get anywhere. So you need to spend some time developing, like subscribing to those newsletters, to those magazines, mm -hmm. going to those events, understanding who these people are reading the blogs that they you read you need to know yes. everything about yeah. that because yeah. you're going to eat yeah. you're gonna, that's hard you need yeah, that's really to good. know it and you need to be willing to commit to them for x number of years this isn't like a short-term yeah. dating yeah. situation this is long term you're about to move in all right like you Not need to know yeah. yeah like you need to know like really if you're going to commit all this money to move in with them yeah uh -huh. like you want to get to know them yeah right so like yeah. spend more time understanding your target market mm -hmm. right and it's like you can pick up on subtle words like things that they need products that they find problems with Oh, yeah. Or things that they're like, oh god, I wish I had a this, or like, man, that thing sucks. Mm -hmm. That thing sucks. You can make it better, mm -hmm. right? right. And oh, it's yeah. like, if, as soon, sure. so you can start to see like where people's ideas are, and then also what kinds of events they attend, because that's going to heavily impact your marketing budget. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, yeah. where are they going? You know, like, what are the in-person events where you might have a booth to sell your product? Yeah. yeah. Right. And in the beginning stages, it's critical to make those phone calls and find out. How much does that booth cost? Yeah. Right? Because you're building out budgets, right? You want to know, okay, these are the 10 shows. I'm still doing product development. These are the 10 shows I'm looking at. And five of these cost X amount. Three of them cost another amount. Two of them are in my price range. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to be getting ready to spend money and time at these two events, right? With yeah. my product. So really think about like who they are, what they're into. Mm. Get to know them. Yeah. Right? And make sure like, that you like them. Yeah. yeah. I think I said this briefly, but that you connect with them, right? Yeah, that makes sense. In some way. Because you're going to have to speak their them. language, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so either it's you speak their language or your copywriter speaks their language. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> it's like, again, sometimes we tend to think we need to do everything. Right. We don't. There's a reason why copywriters exist. There's a reason why graphic designers <laughs> exist. It's because they can make shit, right? And they yeah. can like create the story that we maybe don't have the talent or skill or time to create, mm -hmm. right? So oh, yeah. it's it's a matter of you knowing what they need and then building that manufactured desire to satisfy what they want, you know? Yeah, oh, that's, that's really good. Okay, that's a lot of good stuff to think about. So okay, thank cool. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? I, 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 I have more mellow background music, because every once in a while I'm like, we are like, rocking, yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Good, how are you? Good. Awesome. Yeah. So do you all have like three turn keys for really navigating the politics of the fashion industry? Ooh, I like it. <laughs> okay, so we're talking politics like, 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 what the hell do we do with like our president right now? Politics or um, <laughs> sorry, or like is this politics? Like how do we like negotiate with the factory? Right. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know where this was going. Right. I, I had to qualify this. Okay. I live in LA. Okay. So please go ahead, guys. I mean, I guess in terms like, is there anything specific that you are like? Well, <clears throat> so I'm working with Blue Meets Blue, and um, I work as a project manager, so I've worked, you know, in visual arts, in music, and in film, okay. but I want to make sure that I'm walking the razor's edge mm. when it comes to the fashion industry, talking to the right people, mm. opening the right doors, you know, and making sure. What is Blue Meets Blue? Can you tell me a little bit? Well, Blue Meets Blue is this line that Shad has okay. launched that is oh, dealing okay. with um, refugee Syrian women, okay. um, and they are making the clothes. And so right now it's a, a, a slow fashion, a slow fashion line. Love um, it. Yeah, yeah. But you know they want to stay ethical and things like that. But we also want to 
um, enter into the global marketplace and you know I just want to make sure I want to navigate things as I'm talking to people mm. with okay. about it. Cool. I think Shama's touched on education a lot tonight, kind of mm -hmm. educating yourself in terms of these you know, social media platforms and all of that. And I, I think that that kind of rings true in terms of entering into like the product development and production side of this industry as well, because you're essentially learning a new language, mm -hmm. right? We talked about a placket and a hem turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Right? So there are two things in construction and there's a lot more of that. Okay. So I think the more education that you can do in terms of familiarizing yourself just with, if you're talking about specifically like factories and production and maybe, you know, we were speaking earlier about possibly moving some of your things, you know, to be developed in a more mass production and then bringing it back to the Syrian refugees to finish or, you know, something along those lines. But if that's kind of where your brain is, um, I would say educating yourself on just the industry speak and the terminology and learning, approaching this as if you're learning a new language would be yes. very helpful in terms of just communicating to your supply chain or your future supply chain. So the language. Yeah. What yes, else? it's also important to approach like any new vendor, factory especially, <laughs> from a humble place. Um, you don't want to like run and like run over them. Like I need you to do this. Like you need to approach them, you know, you want to build a relationship. And next week. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and yesterday. You know, you want to build a long term relationship with any of your vendors, whether it's fabric mm -hmm. or factory. So you need to go in, you know, polite and humble and ready to explore that relationship. You not only, you know, are you feeling them out, they're feeling you out. You know, they can be like, we're too busy for you. But, you know, if you go in with that, the right attitude, willing to work with them and learn from them and learn with them, then you'll get, like, the two-way street of mm -hmm. wanting to learn about your brand and what you want to do. And on the, like, sales side of that, I'd say, like, it's so dope what you guys are doing. And, like, tell people, like... You know, like this is what we're up to, and re but remember, buyers, like retail buyers and consumers, are always if you're sustained, no matter what your like ethical foundation is, right? Sustainable, fair trade, where you're getting manufactured, etc. Aesthetics come first, okay. right? So if it doesn't, it's like if it doesn't look good, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter mm -hmm. where it came from, right? Because at the end of the day, the buyers have to fulfill a need in the market. Right, so it's not that they don't like the story, it's that they're trying to satisfy a 70% sell through in another collection that happened the season before, and they're hedging their best like bets like an investment banker. And they're saying, All right, well, I gotta satisfy this category, this price point, you know, this particular customer, mm -hmm. right? So, really make sure it's aesthetics first, and then totally make sure you tell people the story, yeah. you know, the like the story sell. is key, yeah. right? The story is important. Right, the story is relevant. The story is is really impactful, and people, if the aesthetics are on point, mm -hmm. the story is going to send them over the edge. Mm -hmm. Right, but the story is the icing on the cake. The product, <coughs> the visual assets, your branding, the store, like the verbal story, like how you guys talk about the brand, all of that. That is what's going to sell them. Mm -hmm. Right, and then and then the other stuff. Right, but if they open up an email and they see images and they're like, eh, not sure about that. They're not going to read the story. Okay. Right? So, like, invest in the right photography. The right photography doesn't mean it's expensive photography. It just means finding the right people to do the right photography, right, in the ways that you want, right? Mm -hmm. so, so focus on the aesthetics of it and then just drive home the story once you've totally nailed that. So aesthetics, education, and humble approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that our three... Three okay. <laughs> oh, and just about the humble approach, it's yeah. like, it's such a valuable thing that you mentioned, which is like, yeah, like people will, like these people are making things for you, right? Like people are like helping to produce and make things. It's labor, right? So oftentimes when we think about manufacturing or production, it's like, oh yeah, I have someone who's going to do that for me or, you know, it's like sometimes there's a disconnection between the people who are actually making it in the process and you guys who are managing it and then like... You know, like the fact that it comes full circle, right? So it's like when you're starting off that kind of deeper level of like, hey, we're all in this together. We're, you know, you're doing me a favor, you know, by working with me in this fledgling stage, you know, and I'm going to be really appreciative of that because I realize that there's no like guarantee of anything in the future, but the fact that we're both in this together creating something amazing and we're going to see where this goes. 
you know? And so again, it's like, even though you might have a ton of contractors, we're all on the same team, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's an important mentality. I want to piggyback on that. A lot of um, people come to us from other businesses and they come from retail or wherever where they think that the customer is always right. Not in production. <laughs> uh, nope. Especially, I mean, this is a little different story, but especially if you're producing in America, factories are busy. You're a new designer. They don't care. You know, they, they have bigger fish to deal with. Yeah, prioritizing their reoccurring customers that they know are coming back. Yeah, to it's a season. top Because they've got them, especially yes. now with Made in the USA mm-hmm. being so hot. You know, and there are so many designers that are launching. It's like, these guys are so busy. You know how hard it is for me to get a hold of them sometimes? I'm like, hey, guys. They're like, we're so busy with all of our clients. I'm like, I know, but I want to say hi. You know, like, like these guys, like, people are super busy, right? Which is amazing, right? It is amazing that there is this renaissance of industry, that there is this new found optimism with production. Like, all of it's amazing. But that just makes relationships even more important. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's yes. so important to start building a relationship with the factory and let them know that that's what you're looking to do. Yes. You're not looking to like do this first launch and go somewhere else. You're looking to be with them and build with them and be bigger mm-hmm. with them. And listen to them because a lot of times they might have insight into a more efficient way to construct your product. Or, you know, we did something like this in the past and it turned out really well. Can we, can we do that for you? And then be open to that instead of like, this is it. This is what I want. You know, because kind of goes back to relationship building and relying on them for their expertise as well. Yeah, not awesome. just a labor point, but this is what we do every day. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to prepare you to have to the factory level. <laughs> Thank you. I have one more question and it's personal. So my 11 year old daughter is interested in designing house shoes right now. Cute. Um, how, can, how can I as a mother be most supportive of her endeavors? Mm. Wow. <laughs> I love, I really love mom, this question. How, yeah. Can the mom <laughs> please speak? Um, my son is eight months old, so we're all the way from time. Okay. <laughs> but just to <laughs> imagine. <laughs> in shoes right now. Um, I would just, like, encourage her to be a junior entrepreneur. You know, that's so exciting right now. And I know, I still love Shark Tank. I know a lot of people don't watch the show. But, like, when the kids go on there, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? it's very so I would just encourage that like that junior entrepreneurship letter sketch you know okay. take her take her shopping as research um, where you're not like buying a bunch of house shoes but you're taking pictures for future inspiration okay. you know like let her play the role of like this junior mm. designer junior entrepreneur teach her marketing yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm good with sales <laughs> okay so she get it from her mama right. okay but yeah. like but like make sure like even if it's like that let like, just like get her into thinking about marketing because okay. guys like marketing is like <laughs> so critical right. product you don't have right this yeah. and I would just say just also just tell them it's okay to try something and you know it doesn't have to work out perfectly yeah, you know okay. just give it a shot and do your best and see what happens you know right. because I think so many kids are afraid not to be perfect and they're the way the school system is, is that, like, you know, everyone, it's like you have to get an A, or, you know, but it's important to try new things and yeah. stretch yourself. Celebrate the successes, but celebrate the failures, too. Right. You, you know what I mean? Right. What like, truly is a success? No, not to get esoteric. Right. <laughs> I didn't know if marketing shit kind of works for me. I know. Oh, I do, like, just being able to be like, yeah, you can do that. Like, I mean, we ended up in fashion, right? Like, we've had people tell us this that's not a viable career. Like, yeah. you're never going to make money doing that. Like, but we're all sitting here, right? We all are somewhat successful, and, like, we're all entering into this business. It's just, like, not saying no to it. Like, yeah. there's so many different career paths. Like, if that's where she wants to go, then, like, like yeah, of course. Like, so what can we help you get there? If the house yeah. shoes don't work out, just, what's next? Okay. Yeah. What's yeah. your next yeah. idea? Yeah. 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 To do the next thing. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's so exciting. And then we're from Chicago and house music and house Yeah. Shoes. Oh my yeah. god. Good branding. You got some good branding on your hands. You guys, I think we have time for like one more question before we're gonna like have more wine, turn the music up, have a little dance party. I'm in it for the dance party. Yeah, that's like water. Water great water. Hello. Okay. 
Okay, so um, first of all, for the young man who wants to know about the older generation, I am free for a really good martini if you want to know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your this is what networking is about, guys. <laughs> this is... Um, I don't want to like go on forever. I um, some of the stuff that advice that you were given to all of the other people. I tried a lot of it last year. I got my small collection together. I had very few pieces, um, professionally photographed, and I decided I was going to. I did all my research on what boutiques that, that I felt that they would fit in. I looked for, I do a lot of print pattern, bright colors, higher price point. Um, so people that sold like Millie, Nanette Lepore, mm -hmm. um, Clover Canyon, and then even on up to the, you know, higher. Like, I mean, like, if, um, so yeah. looking for those kind of boutiques, plus a lot of the more independent names. Um, so I rented a car, went on the road, I hit because like where I live, I'm from Indianapolis, it's not going to sell there. Um, so I went to Cincinnati, Louisville, Lexington, Atlanta, Charlotte, I went to like all these places and it was, it was interesting, I had a lot of people, almost That's everybody like, was nice, nice. <laughs> almost everybody was nice. And this is, this was my approach, I wouldn't bring Sam, and I had like emailed all the plate like you know like get, and I'm surprised how many places don't have a website yep. but like I would find all the places um, I would email them I had sent them these um, trifolds that I had made ahead of time said I was going to be in their town this week done all that so I go around I don't bring a sample store but I always wear a piece mm -hmm. and usually they approach me first because they're going to comment on what I'm wearing and so there's my segue into it. Um, most people, like, you know, they would just, like, look at my literature. I think there was one place in Chicago that I actually got to bring samples into. She took pictures of them. Um, so when I got back from all that, I emailed them all again, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it was nice to meet you, or I was, you know, it's your store. And every email I have, like, just one or two photos in line, just so it would click mm -hmm. who I am, what I represent. Like, not one order, ever. Did they all open them emails? I don't know. Mm. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. And then after that, I took, I still had the trifolds again, and a lot of my, and then I also did the places I couldn't visit, like I didn't go over the whole U.S. So, like, everybody that fit in, like, you know, west of the Mississippi, and then like the eastern seaboard, I took um, from my samples, because they had a lot of texture, that I cut up little fabric swatches, stapled them to a thing, put them in with the trifold so they could actually touch mm -hmm. the fabrics with, along with line sheets and just like a little introductory letter. Then I would follow those up with an email, not one order. Mm -hmm. Not one order. What, what cities did you go to? Like Charlotte, Atlanta, Lexington, and that's and that's the thing. It's like everywhere I went, people were complimenting. Nashville. I went to Austin, Nashville. I went to Nashville, Nashville and Austin. Those are the two places that have a ton of independent designers mm -hmm. and a ton of stores that sell that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they are they're more welcoming. I might try designers. Austin. That collection that I had, I felt Austin, the temperature was probably too warm for the, like some of the warmer climates. I like go to Minneapolis too. That's yeah. another place where there, there's actually a specific store to go to and I'll show Okay, because I hit a lot of people in, in Minneapolis with mailers. I hit a lot of them too. <laughs> but Those are really good in yeah. designer tents. It's just so, and like the people that I talked to in Chicago, like, she was like taking, but she was like, well, I gotta check with my co-owner. And then I would follow up with emails. And I actually almost got an appointment before they bagged on me. Mm. Like almost got an appointment. And I know when I was leaving this one shop in Lexington, I'm walking to my car and somebody's yelling out their car window. I love your outfit. Mm. Because it, it's- What's your branding like? I, What's I your just, logo like? It's- What's the brand name? It's Pariah. Okay. And we, um, I, you know, it, like my branding is, it's, it's fun. 
like it's for people with personality. Funny. That's <laughs> that's a very vague statement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't. I actually had to hire a writer to write my about page. I I think because I personally don't buy into branding, I can't represent it. But I know that about myself. So like, I hired a writer. What does your logo to, look like? Um, I recently had it redone, and I think I have a copy of it with me on my current business card. Mm. Um, as you, you've liked my stuff on Instagram mm. before. Um, it's, I mean, I'm sure it could probably stand to be redone, and I think that's yeah. where I struggle is with the branding. Like, I just kind of keep throwing stuff out there, throwing stuff out there, so it would be like the like, song on the radio. Yeah, well, yeah. the song on the radio that after a while, it's like, okay, okay. So something could be wrong. So, like, here's yeah, an important be. thing. Yeah. It's like, it's, so I gotta tell you, as, like, a former buyer at Ann Taylor, I bought some stuff that I was like, what? Like, I don't think anyone was gonna wear this, and, like, it sold through like crazy, right? So I'm a firm believer that there's, like, literally a market for almost everything. Right. right. Like, That's, oh, absolutely. There's literally a market for like everything. everything. But it's super important to know if you're communicating to that market right. that you can sell to. And sometimes the market that's going to want your stuff isn't the market you necessarily right. want. Right. You know? And so right. not to, I mean, obviously I don't know too much foregrounding on like what is going on in terms of the actual branding, et cetera. But it's, it's very important to stay after a certain period of time, like I said, we were talking about a little while ago, do I pivot or pursue, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm doing this for 18 months, 24 months, I'm getting static here, like, something's wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, something's not working. You certainly didn't start a company to, to have it be a charity. Right. Right? You started a company to make some money, mm -hmm. right? So if it's not making money, you gotta change something about the company so it can make money, right? So it's really about saying to yourself, okay, well, this may not be my last business, but it might be my first, you know? And so what is it of this business that I need to um, change in order to either adapt to the market or appeal to the market that maybe actually wants my product that I'm not actually speaking to right now, you know? And I think so it's more it's, getting my message to that market. Mm. Like it's, like I guess that's the hard part. Like how do I find that market, like, you know, are they really, um, you know, are they on Instagram? I'm like, I'm... Who do you think your market is? I'm going to say, like, because they're going to have to afford it between... How much does it cost? Um, and see, now I'm getting, like, bogged down in between the wholesale and the retail price. Like, the, well, like, the trench coat that I wore in here tonight, it is, a, like, it's out of 45% recycled content, it's made in USA, so if you were to do brick and mortar, it'd be almost $1,000. Okay, so like we need to make sure that everything else kind of warrants that $1,000 price tag. I've yeah. had yeah. a bazillion pattern yeah. makers work on it because I've been sewing for 50 years mm. and fit is very important to me and fabric Perfect. quality is very important to me. And I can't tell you how appalled I was when I went to a bin at <coughs> Burberry store at how cheap their fabrics are. But I think to your point is about more like the brand. Yeah. So I gotta tell it's you, hard. there's a, there's a great example brand. that I like to use. It's like, you have three black cotton t-shirts one is $25, one is $50, and one's like $500. And they're all made pretty much in the same way, mm -hmm. right? And why do they charge three different prices? It's the branding, right? Right. It is not the actual fabrication or the material or any of it that predicates the pricing, right? It mm -hmm. is the branding that predicates the pricing. And that so, goes back to your perceived value. Exactly. Right. 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 Exactly, exactly. So, Sadly, um, I don't have all your materials in front of me. Right. But what I would say is like have like a an arm test kind of conversation <laughs> mm -hmm. about where you are in your business. You know, like is this an opportunity for you to look at product development and costing and all of that and say, okay, maybe I need to lower some of these things in order to be able to hit a certain price point that might sell better. Or do I need to restructure my branding, my conversations, and the markets that I'm selling in, mm -hmm. right, that are actually more receptive to what it is that I'm trying to pitch to them? 
Right. I really like the price point is kind of more based on the fact that it is made in USA and it's the fabrics I choose. But and customers yeah. don't know that, right? right. I know that I know they don't know. like I know they don't yeah. know that but like I cannot personally dumb down on the fabric because like when you say be your brand, that's what I am. Mm -hmm. I am my brand and I you know, I'm not gonna say everything that I have is like cashmere or something like that, but it's still like good quality fabric because I can't stand cheap fabric. So I think you just answered her question. So what you need to do then is adjust your branding to make right. sure that everything Probably. that comes like, out of you, yeah. your voice, your labels, your overall view of how everything mm -hmm. looks speaks to that thousand dollars. And that luxury customer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I don't I mean I'm not luxury, but I'm a thousand dollars. I mean, you're definitely advanced contemporary. Yeah. Right. So when you think about a thousand, it's like okay, that's definitely advanced contemporary is like between five hundred and like twenty five hundred. Right? right. It's kind of the advanced right. contemporary market. But if that jacket is on the higher end, then yeah, it's advanced contemporary. If that's the entry level mm -hmm. price point for a product collection, then you're kind of on the luxury scale, right? If your prices go up much further than that. Yeah. And well, and that's the highest thing. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Everything, everything else advanced. goes down. Everything yeah. else goes down. It's just that particular yeah. coat, the way it has to be cut because the design goes in one direction and you have to match it up. Like it's yeah. totally complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. You waste a lot of fabric. Yeah. Recycled yeah. bottles and then yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> anyway, awesome. Okay. I think well, the good news is that we've kind of pinpointed the pain the point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had my little Howard Lamb branding book I was trying to read on the Aww. bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see the coat come. Oh, yeah. oh my god, all, and on that note guys, thank you for listening this all whole right, entire time. Let's have some wine.